Thank you, Bev. It takes three clicks to do it, and I only did the one click. I am so excited to introduce you to my friend and colleague, Lorraine Johnson. She's the author of 10 books and countless articles. Her most recent book, A Garden for the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, is destined to become the native plant Bible for Southern Ontario, the Northern States, and beyond. Now, I want to start off with a question about a garden for the rust, rusty patch bumblebee, Lorraine. Tell me, why did you decide to feature the rusty patch bumblebee? Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation to be here tonight. I'm thrilled. It's nice to be with a, a group of people who are so keen on butterflies and plants. It's really lovely to be here, so thanks. Um, as for why, um, my co-author and I, my co-author was is Sheila Cola, and uh, the reason why we chose the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, um, the book is about, you know, supporting all pollinators and actually all insects, but we have Rusty Patch Bumblebee in the title and, and a special place for Rusty Patch Bumblebee um, for that species in the book, because in many ways, well, first of all, Sheila Cola is um, the, she's a conservation biologist and rusty patch bumblebee is one of the species she studied. And in fact, she was the last person in Canada to identify that bee in the wild. So it's a, um, she's done a lot of work trying to find it. She's documented its decline. So in many ways, it, um, that bee stands in for, a lot of, I don't know, the, it, the, it, it makes it very personal in some ways to think about one particular species that has experienced this drastic decline, you know, in just in the last few decades and that Sheila was the last person to see it in the wild in Canada. So that's, uh, that's why we, we include, also there's something about people just really identify with this sweet little bee. You know, it really does make conservation and the need to protect pollinators very personal when you can associate with one particular species, I guess. Yes, a poster species. And, mm -hmm. you know, I heard a couple of years ago that the rusty patch bumblebee was in trouble and I didn't do any more research. So I'm in my backyard and everywhere I go looking for this rusty patch bumblebee and I spot a few. Okay, I look at the butt and there is this circle of rust and that's got to be a rusty patch bumblebee. Now I have Heather Holmes book and I could have taken a picture and looked it up but I just satisfied myself that I had in my backyard rusty patch. So thank you for uh, bringing that to life that uh, the, the hunt is is still on and what can be more fun than a hunt for whatever rare thing that you're looking for, or even a common thing like a um, like a like a monarch caterpillar. Mm. You know, Carol, um, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the importance of taking photographs of the bees you see and sending that, those photos to bumblebeewatch.org and participating in that kind of community science because. There are a lot of lookalike bees, and um, chances are very, uh, it's very likely that the bees that you were seeing were not actually rust patch bumblebees, but one of the lookalikes. But it's really important to send those photos to the Community Science Project to help um, scientists sort of evaluate the populations of, of different species of bumblebees. So they can kind of get baseline data, but um, it really, there's been no confirmed sightings um, and a lot of people are looking uh, in, um, in Ontario or Canada. It's, it's certainly, a, and its range has just shrunk so that there are, there, there are some uh, uh, still, there are some, uh, population still in the in the U.S. Midwest, but not here in um, in its previous range in Canada, unfortunately. 
Well, that is really good to know for some of us citizen scientists because we know I naturalist. And what's the other one? Um, well, e, e, e something. E butterfly. E butterfly. e butterfly. Okay, e butterfly. those are the ones. And I naturalist. Okay, but I have written in this sidebar for everyone bumblebee.org, and that's where to send the sightings, correct? Um, I'm pretty sure we're going to Google it. Butterfly watch. Um, okay, no, just give that homework to Bev. Bev, <laughs> okay, yeah. Beverly, look that up for a, a, a Bumblebee watch or whatever mm -hmm. you can find on Bumblebee Org, the place where citizen scientists report their sightings of bees. Okay, because Lorraine, you're busy. Uh, here's, what <laughs> you're busy. here's what you're busy with, Lorraine. I would like you to tell us all how your education and interests led you to writing books about native plants. Oh. <laughs> well, I really came to this work in a very circuitous way. Like not, um, it's actually, if you'd asked me when I was in my early twenties, would I be doing this? No, I had no idea. I studied literary theory and criticism in university. What can you do with that degree? Um, I ended up in publishing, which I, I loved. I realized I wanted to work with books. I wanted to be an editor. And um, while I was working as an editor at Penguin Books, um, I came up with an idea for a book that I wanted to write. And I hadn't, um, you know, it was, a, it was an aspiration that was new to me. I hadn't realized I wanted to write books. I was happy being an editor. But I wanted to write a book about environmental issues and really kind of um, explain for the general public. I mean, I had questions. What's acid rain? What's the ozone? This was in the in the uh, late 80s. So what's ozone layer depletion? What's the greenhouse effect? I wanted to translate that scientific information for a general audience and then connect it with what we could do as individuals to actually you know, do something positive and try to help in terms of, um, uh, you know, having a, a positive impact. So um, Penguin Books, I submitted the proposal anonymously because I worked there and, um, and I really wanted them to evaluate it on its merits and they decided to publish it. So I've been writing books ever since and I've also been focusing on this sort of idea of you know, help, um, sort of translating global issues into local action and 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 science in some ways. I mean, I am not a scientist. I, I have no claims whatsoever to that. I but trying to um, make some of that information very accessible and, and exciting for people and motivate and motivational, like hope to inspire people to take individual action about these huge global problems and to sort of recognize that actually there is a lot that we can do within our local spheres of influence through in some cases really simple actions in other cases a lot more complicated things but there are places for all of us whatever level of engagement we want to have there are places for all of us to to enter into these issues and do something about them. Yes, there's a poster going around that says, basically, I'm completely overwhelmed with all the problems of the world, and you want to throw up your hands in despair, but in your own yard, you can at least make a positive difference quickly. Yeah, especially if you think about insects and how small they are and how many of them, you know, have very, very small ranges of movement in their whole lives and so you know that to me it was transformational to think about um, and again it got very personal to think you know I can make a home in this very tiny spot for a creature whose movements are in its whole life are in a very tiny spot and this spot will be meaningful for it for that creature. So um, yeah, I think in particular with insects, you know, and as you know, you know, with 
butterflies and creating habitat. If, if the plants aren't there for their, you know, those butterflies in their larval stage, you know, you're not going to have the adults. And that's something we can do. We can, you know, plant the larval host plants. It's a very direct action with immediate impact and implications and positive effects. Yeah, you're reminding me of Wayne, uh, Wayne Dwyer when he couldn't save all the fish, but he had a handful of them and he threw them back into the water and he said, I can, I can save these. Um, if I understand you correctly, you submitted a proposal to one single publisher and it was accepted. Yes, it's, it's um, unbelievable that things at one point in publishing were actually <laughs> in some ways very simple. Uh, yeah, it was, the, it was in the 1980s and it was in Canadian publishing, which was in a kind of boom period. And it was about a topic that was finally really grabbing people's attention again. I mean, there was that environmental waves, wave in the early 70s around, you know, the beginning of Earth Day and the response, well, in the 60s, I guess, to Rachel Carson's book. And then there was interest in the 70s with Earth Day. But then in the late 80s, again, um, people, I, I certainly experienced it, witnessed it, this kind of renewed um, sense of urgency and interest and so that's you know um, that's what the book was about and so it really it hit its moment and and that's it was called green future how to make a world of difference and penguin published it in 1990 so it was a very different time in the same way that actually getting a job in publishing you know I said I I did literary studies in university and then thought what am I going to do with this oh well I'm interested in publishing I literally wrote a letter to the editor in chief of Penguin Books said, hey, I'm interested in working in publishing. Can we talk? And we met and I was hired. I mean, that is astonishing. It's, I feel so incredibly lucky to have been, you know, at, at, you know, right place, right time. It, that just doesn't happen anymore. So in that's very, of, very inspiring. Um, you got your job right place, right time, but you got that book published because you sent it in and you sent it in anonymously. So you didn't have that privilege. And mm -hmm. I hear you that that was a long time ago, but only 11 years ago, I took this, which you can't see, but it's my book. Mm -hmm. um, oh, there we go. You got to put it, there we go. Anyway, I took this book to only three publishers, only three publishers, and one of them accepted it. So um, your story, I want everybody to know that you can do whatever you want without relevant education. You just need to have the passion. You can get your book published still uh, if you knock on the right doors or self-publishing. So Lorraine, you were able to uh, launch this whole career on this book, write another nine books after that, and a bazillion uh, articles uh, without a degree in biology. And uh, every one of you listening can teach, inspire, uh, and, uh, and, and, and do the same thing. And I am going to share my screen now. And we are going to have a look at the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. Now, this is quite an amazing book. And where do you ever get a chance to look at like 20 or 30 pages of a book before you buy it? This preview is available online. Audrey, are you looking at a preview of, of the book, the cover? Okay, you got to unmute yourself. Thank you. Anyway, I'll assume you can because you're not going well. Yes. Here's, yay. Yes. All right. So here is the cover of Lorraine's new book with Sheila, A Garden for the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, Creating Habitat for Native Pollinators. Um, a Garden for the Rusty Patch Bumblebee provides all the information gardeners need to take action to support and protect pollinators by creating habitat in yards and community spaces, on balconies, boulevards, and everywhere. 
with more than 300 native plants of Ontario and the Great Lakes region profiled in detail, along with sample garden designs, ideas for beautiful plant pairings, and numerous tips for success, this fully illustrated guide helps gardeners discover the crucial connections between native plants and native pollinators and learn how to cultivate patches of pollinator paradise. So this is what the publisher wrote, but has anybody prominent said anything nice about this book? Well, Doug Ptolemy. And I bet you've all heard of Doug Ptolemy. What does Doug Ptolemy say? Author of Bringing Nature Home. What a valuable, comprehensive, timely, and beautiful resource. Lorraine Johnson and Sheila Cohn provide the rationale, urgency, and detailed know-how for restoring essential pollinator habitats, not only for the rusty patch bumblebee, but for all of Ontario's pollinators. And stay tuned, we're going to talk about the American edition of this book. That's going to happen soon. Okay, Heather Holmes the bee person who's written all these bee books. This book has it all. Sample garden plans, beautiful illustrations and photographs, a comprehensive section profiling native plants and the specific pollinators the plants support. And she goes on and on and on. Um, so, but why would you want to take the word of these most important people in the world on native plants? Okay, on North, in North America. Have a look at the um, table of contents. She talks, because she has so much experience speaking, she answers your questions before you even ask them. So look at chapter two, native plants matter. But don't non-native plants attract pollinators too? Why does she ask that? Because in every presentation, somebody puts them their hand up and asks. So this has not only the information that she wants to deliver, but all the questions answered that people have asked during her 5,000 presentations. Okay, starting your garden. Profiles of native plants, sample garden designs. That's a, a really good thing for balconies, community gardens, public patches, high density residential and residential garden. And then a huge list of resources. How many pages have we got in this book? Over 250 pages. This is the book that you want on your uh, shelf. And uh, so you can go to wherever this link is. You can ask me because I got it. It's public. And you can have a really good look at this book uh, just in case I haven't convinced you already. Okay, so here's an example of, a, of the 300 plants profiled where she's got the blooming time, exposure, height, uh, specialist relationships. So for me, it's really important that I plant something to attract a caterpillar that I want to raise. So I can see right there that this plant is a larval host for the silver spotted and long tailed skippers. Long tailed skippers, they have those long tails. I haven't got one of those yet. I'm going to have to get some of this tick tree foil from my local native plant place. And uh, there's your sample garden designs of your balcony, where she shows you spring blooming, summer blooming, and fall blooming. And here is a list of all these other books that she's written. But I'm going to go to her website uh, specifically to um, to have to, uh, more of a look at that. Um, and very soon, why don't you, if you have a question at this point, why don't you put your hand up? And we can have a few questions from the audience because um, it's your turn. I, can I can I have a turn first? You can have a turn, <laughs> Lorraine. Go ahead. You thank have a turn. you. Thank you so much, Carol, for you know everything you've you've said about the book for your enthusiasm. It's a real honor, and I appreciate it very much. the The book um, uh, it it was. Um, well, it was a huge pleasure to uh, to work on this book with Sheila to to write it and to um, have it out there. And I have to say, one of the, I guess you know there are a lot of well, I guess more in the U.S. than in Canada, but in the U.S. there are a lot of native plant books. So I was like, well, what is it 
you know, that we offer that's different? How can, you know, why write another native plant book? What's the point here? And that section that you highlighted on the specific pollinator relationships between each of the plants we profile. Um, I do feel um, very um, just so pleased that that is in the book that we put that out there. Uh, we, we researched so many databases to pull that information together for each of the plants we profile. But um, I don't personally, I don't know of anywhere else in a book that all of that has been brought together in one place for each plant. So for the bees, the moths, and the butterflies, and also some, we, we mentioned some beetles as well and specialist relationships. But anyway, that's that's something that it, I, and if anyone knows of another book that does it, tell me. <laughs> but um, I think it's unique to that, to our book. And, and I'm just, um, Anyway, I really appreciate your your enthusiasm for the book, Carol. Thank you. Well, I'm I'm really glad you said that because um, we may still do it. I was going to go through a list of all your books and why you felt the need to write one more. What's unique about it? And we may just review that a little bit later. But right now, Heidi's going to ask her question. Hi there. Hi, Lorraine. Really pleased to uh, meet you here. Um, definitely. Uh, your book, the, the Garden for the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, has been my my growing season companion of the last year. I, I'm I live in Toronto, and I'm a recipient of a Pollinate TO grant. So I've always puttered in the garden, but I'm no no plant expert. Um, I I tell people the first native plant I knew was was uh, milkweed because someone showed me how to raise a monarch. And I tell people, don't, you know, careful of that because it's the gate, raising a monarch is the gateway drug to pollinator gardening and <laughs> care about one bug and one plant. And the next thing you know, you care, you start caring about all of them. So, um, so I've dove into my pollinator gardening uh, adventure in a public garden and your book has been my companion. It is dog-eared and dirty with dirt because it's right in the garden with me. Um, but so here's my question. Um, I'm in an urban environment and I understand, and you repeated it, that bees don't roam very far, many of them. Um, so, and yet having pollinator gardens, even in an urban setting, I'm told is very important. So how do the bees, and you know, I just did a presentation at where my garden is, it's at a school and I did a presentation to grade 11 kids and I'm glad they didn't nab me on this one because I was telling them about, you know, pollinator gardens, support bees and, you know, you know, the, the thing we say, you know, one third, every third bite of food we eat is in our mouths because of bees exist. If they disappear, so does our food. But how do our urban bees that we are supporting and creating habitat for really contribute to the food system in a general sense. Oh, wow. Because they don't travel to where we're growing food. Oh, amazing question. So first of all, it's really important to say that, you know, there are more than 800 different species of wild uh, bees, native bees in Canada. So huge number. And I think in Ontario, it's, uh, I can't remember offhand, but it's like 450 or more. Um, D different species of native bees and um they all you know they they have different you know different lengths of you know mouth part different mouth parts and different kind of plants that they are able to pollinate depending on how you know where the nectar is where the pollen is in a specific plant and the kind of basically the 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 kind of physical nature of the plant. So with food, so cities are actually incredible um, habitat for bees because there's actually, and this was sort of counterintuitive when I sort of learned it, that cities actually can have more floral diversity than agricultural areas, especially now that agriculture is basically monoculture, you know, these huge, farms with like one or two species. 
So cities are good habitat for bees. There's a lot of, um, they support a lot of bee diversity through the plant diversity. Um, uh, but your question in terms of how do bees, um, you know, pollinate food in this, in the agricultural areas, is that what you mean, sort of? Well, you know, like I've read some things about how bees like hold the ecosystem together, bees oh, and yeah. pollinators in general, okay. and yeah, how yeah. our food, you know, like I'm trying to think, how do you motivate urban people who are very disconnected from the okay. food system? We right. tend to say, oh, one in three of your right. bites of food comes from bees, and therefore you should plant a pollinator yeah. garden in your backyard, and you right. will be helping the bees that feed you and I'm thinking no nah, not really you're feeding okay. the bees and the diversity of bees maybe in right. some, someone's veggie garden in Toronto but okay well I guess this point about you know motivating people by letting them know that cities are actually very important habitat for bees cities can support this great diversity of bees in a way that agricultural areas don't I think that's very motivating for people I also think we have to kind of expand the discussion beyond humans and food and because especially that figure about you know is it a third of each you know the food we eat like that there's a lot of actually debate around what that number is but and it's and and it's a very you know anthropocentric human-centered way to talk about it but the is that all ecosystems would basically collapse without pollinators because, um, you know, something like 80%, 90%, you see different figures of all flowering plants have some kind of animal pollinator relationship. So, and, in, and bees are the main pollinators in the terrestrial ecosystems in North America. So without bees, with, uh, so in, in terms of your question of how to motivate people in cities, well, one, to talk about how important cities can be as a refuge, in fact, for bee diversity, and to talk about how all ecosystems, all flower, you know, the vast majority of flowering plants, which are the basis of all, you know, like the food chains, you know, the herbivores that are eating, plants, the carnivores that are eating herbivores, and on and on, you know, up the food chain. Plants are, you know, the basis of life. And so um, I, I hope that would motivate people. I find it pretty motivating to think, um, you know, life depends on pollinators, life depends on plants. It's a whole interconnected system. And so to really let people in cities know that we can make a difference by planting habitats, supporting pollinators in these in these urban places, it's crucial. Yeah, it's and crucial you know, you know um, Lorraine, and, and I'm just finding in Toronto, and I'm sure other places, that more and more people are planting food. They're planting mm -hmm. food right. in the front yeah. and in the back. And are they remembering to plant enough plants so that to attract the bees to pollinate their food. So yes. there's a good spot in, in our urban, right in the middle of the urbans where the, the bees are going to uh, account for our food because the new Canadian garden that Mark Cullen wrote a few years ago talks about both native plants that people, that especially young people are moving to and food. Yes, and sorry, I meant to say that as well. Carol, I'm so glad you kind of stressed that point. And of course, yeah, the food um the the food growing in the cities, you just think about what we've all experienced in the pandemic with the incredible um, um, I don't know, just massive interest in actually growing food because of the precariousness of the food system and the supply chains and the way that we are dependent on imports from far away. And that really hit home for people, I think, during the pandemic. And there was a huge growth in interest in food production, which, and of course, actually, urban agriculture is something I also write about and have long been involved in. And so this, um, the, the importance of pollinators 
within the urban environment in terms of food production uh, I, is, you know, it's crucial. And I hope that motivates uh, people. Heidi, in terms of your question of how to, how to really motivate people, I think if you come at it from with all those prongs, um, I think, uh, you know, I think people will kind of understand the, the value of doing this work of planting native plants to support pollinators. Yeah, the other thing is, I, I agree, I don't have a problem getting motivated. Yeah, but also it's about not just about the, the bees. Uh, I like this uh, cities being um, uh, a hub of, of, of extra be diversity even better than an urban a, a rural area you're saying so i like that idea that urban environments create a special uh sort of basket to hold a, a wider diversity of bees so that they don't go extinct and then the plants that connect with those bees also thrive in cities so mm -hmm. and then of course the birds that eat the seeds and then the critters that like it's a whole it's not just about the bees but the plants and the bees are at the core of everything else that thrives from that and then if you build in urban cities like they say those those butterfly pollinator corridors then perhaps mm -hmm. some of these bees and critters can make it to an agricultural setting if they have a way over generations i suppose to travel from corridor to corridor mm -hmm. and also of course i guess another thing important thing to mention just in terms of cities and in, in many ways being refuges um, for uh, for pollinators of course our agricultural areas are are areas of heavy pesticide use and uh, in urban areas certainly in ontario where we have the cosmetic pesticide ban um, you know and although you know golf courses in cities still can use them and get exemptions and that kind of thing um, but um, in terms of the residential landscape in in cities uh, cosmetic pesticide use is banned so um, that that makes cities also import very important habitat uh, for for pollinators uh, thank you, Lorraine, uh, for that. And I'm going to move on to um, Ms. Page. Go ahead and ask your question. Oh, hello. Um, I'm wondering, what's your take on bee hotels? Oh. Because I have a wonderful um, array of native plants, over 100 of them. But then I thought, well, maybe I should provide a bee hotel. <laughs> so my friend made this huge bee hotel. Well, it's this big anyway. And then I read up about it and I'm told that it can be a smoker's board for um, birds. And they think, oh, good, a bee hotel. I'll go and eat all the bees. <laughs> and me, so I never put it out because I was conflicted. And I even got in touch with the Guelph bee people. And the woman answered my question and said she didn't really know whether it was a good idea or not. So what do you think, Lorraine? Oh, thanks for asking that. That's a really great question. And I too have seen some incredible um, footage uh, of um, woodpecker basically having a smorgasbord at a bee hotel. Just, um, um, but uh, in the book, we actually have a section that talks about this because, and it's based on some research that uh, Scott McIver and Lawrence Packer did um, on this question. Because people, you know, there's, uh, there are, these bee hotels are commercially available. There was a real kind of interest in having them. A lot of people were, were putting them in yards and, and community spaces, but no one really knew whether or not they did what, or whether or not there, there were some downsides to it, or, or is it all positive? So what the research that Scott and uh, Lawrence, Lawrence Packer and Scott McIver did really raised some red flags around, first of all, they found that mainly it was, um, B hotels were providing, um, were mainly, or were mostly used, or the majority of species using them ended up being wasps. Um, uh, and then another issue has to do with bee hotels, if they're not looked after properly, if those 
um, you know, chambers or compartments aren't cleaned, aren't replaced, they can become vectors of disease. They can become like, um, you know, basically, you know, hotels for uh, parasites or diseases that will harm bees. Um, a lot of the commercial ones that um, Scott and Lawrence looked at as well, or they talked about the way that some bee hotels, they're actually not, um, they might be, you know, the wrong shape for bees. They might not be long enough, deep enough, or they might be too long, or they might not be the right width. And so really, the, I think given the risks uh, and the, the risk around uh, disease and parasites and the need to properly look after those bee hotels, if you're going to take on that responsibility, really leads me to say the best bee hotel is the one that you talked about right at the beginning, the garden, you know, the plants, is planting native plants. That, that's the most welcoming and useful uh, B hotel there is, as far as I'm concerned. Plus, there's no downside to that. There's no potential of the kind of drawbacks that there are with the B hotels. The one thing I will say, though, um, about B hotels is that there they can certainly kind of galvanize interest around bees. Like people see them, let's say in a public space and there's a little sign and then people start wondering, oh, well, what's that about? But I think there are other signs and ways to kind of, um, I don't know, uh, spread the word about habitat in ways that don't also have some potential downsides or risks like beho those, especially the, you know, well, if they're not looked after properly, those bee hotels can, can um, potentially anyway, be a problem. So uh, uh, in the book, Sheila and I talk about, you know what, plant the plants, create the habitat, that's that's the best uh, welcoming place for bees. Well, speaking of planting the plants uh, in Toronto, we have an initiative called Project Swallowtail. Uh, can you please tell us about that and what your involvement in that is? Yeah, thanks for asking, Carol. And I think you are a Project Swallowtailer as well, aren't you? Yes, would that be fair to say you well in a butterfly way a ranger well, you're involved in some projects like that yes and and one of the things is is that i took a, a program to become a pollinator steward and that was with pollinator partnership and in order to be certified one needs to have a project and i had wanted to put in a boulevard garden anyway and if i'm going to put something in i want to sign and i knew that pollinator uh, that project swallowtail had signs so i wanted a sign and i also knew that they sold plants and even though i had a, a lot of plants they were selling plants that had spring bloom summer bloom and fall bloom all for the same kind of soil so i went and got some of their plants along with a sign so that has now made me and I did a garden tour for for them because I wanted to do that and now that has made me a part of Project Swallowtail even though I don't know everything about the big picture which is what you're going to tell me. Okay. Yeah so um, Project Swallowtail is an amazing so far um, GTA based project Greater Toronto Area based project but we expand all over in a very kind of people express interest in starting a project swallowtail elsewhere and we say yes. So basically what it is, and this kind of refers back to something you were saying, Heidi, about this idea of connected habitat and the importance of it. So what project swallowtail is trying to do is to help and facilitate and support and provide, you know, plants for and educational materials for and motivation and um, for a connected, well, basically connected ribbons of habitat across at this point, Toronto, but we are expanding. And it's a very loose network in some ways in that um, so um, there are, I don't know, 10, about 10 of us on the steering committee, 
um, some of us are representing different organizations, like as you say, Pollinator Partnership is a kind of lead organization. The Toronto and Parkdale Horticultural Society is one of the organizations. But we basically um, try to support people who within their own neighborhoods become what is called a block ambassador. And they will work within their neighborhood to encourage you know, boulevard gardens like you did, Carol, or it could be any project, um, native plant giveaways or um, supporting gardens or um, events of some sort, Pollin you know, anything um, habitat related that can support pollinators, um, project swallowtail, um, uh, you know, encourages, supports, and the block ambassadors kind of, the block ambassadors do most of the local work, but, you know, we, um, the, or the, this loose network of folks who are involved in Project Swallowtail will create videos and other sorts of resources. And then there's, as you say, these plants. We, um, we, um, one of my, I think one of the most exciting Project Swallowtail projects right now is something called Seed Sitters. And what we do is we help people and the help might take the form of seeds or trays and soils and wire mesh to protect these seed these um, trays over the winter. But what we do is we, uh, the seed sitters basically take on the growing of native plants, however many trays they can do. And it kind of, you know, you start with one and by the next year, maybe you're at five or 10 of these seed trays and you take on the propagation of these plants, however many you wanna do. You look after them over the, you know, you plant them in the fall, put them outside in the trays covered in some kind of wire mesh. And then um, in the spring when they've germinated, you'll pot them up and, you know, into bigger pots that are then given away to these various projects, these local small scale um, habitat projects across the city and a lot of community projects as well. So I, I love the seed sitters. I think it's a great, I'd, I'd love to see a lot more of that happening with horticultural groups and garden clubs. I really, uh, Carol, when you talked at the beginning about sort of responsibilities to land care, um, I think one, uh, you know, people are, people who aren't already gardening, but who are worried about pollinators or have heard about pollinator decline and want to do something and might be interested in planting some native plants, there's a real stumbling block. Like, where do I get them? How do I find out what to plant? And so something like Project Swallowtail, that's, you know, people are, they're, the seed sitters are growing the plants and then giving them away. It's a great way to hook people. And I've, I've witnessed it over and over again with some plant giveaways I've done at, at, at my own yard. It's amazing. Neighbors who were never interested in, in the native plants in, in the garden, I don't know, somehow when you're standing out front giving away plants, all of a sudden they can't get enough of them and they're interested and they're planting them. It's amazing. It's really wonderful to see. This is very, very cool. I saw the seed sitters recently and, and more and more people and more and more plants. I didn't realize it was associated with Project Swallowtail, but it's such a great opportunity because yes, we have a few native uh, plant growers around Toronto and the fact the market is growing so fast that there's room for them to stay in business and for a lot of us to get these native plants for free from people who will explain to us uh, exactly how to plant them. Of course, the native plant people will too. But what this allows is absolutely no risk. Come and get a few plants, get started. And what people are finding is that there is a change in their garden with new and exciting insects. And there's been a big change in Toronto in the last 10 years since David Suzuki brought in butterfly rangers. Now, Every year they recruit 30 or 40 rangers, and these are volunteer rangers who are going to do something big in an area where they are. But Project Swallowtail is coming at it at a little bit different angle. They're getting people on streets. Here's your territory, your street, and encouraging you to do something with it. And that 
block ambassador is going to know who's got the seeds for you to get the plants to do it. And in Toronto, when we walk around, we see in the last five, 10 years, a lot more native plants in the front gardens. I can go into the uh, central Toronto and there's monarch caterpillars all over front yards. And a lot when I go to get my early season caterpillars, they're in downtown Toronto because so many neighborhoods have caught on and spread and grown native uh, plants in their front yards, which is very exciting. So I am going to take another quick question. Um, th these are 30 second questions. I'm gonna take a question from um, Rick Gray. You can unmute yourself. And then I'm going to ask you Lorraine, if what happened in Smith's Falls stays in Smith's Falls. So go ahead, Rick. Hey, Lorraine. Um, good to see you again. Um, I want to know how I can get these seed people down here, get something like that going in my neck of the woods, because on the Facebook groups down this way, everybody is winter sowing mm -hmm. and everybody has trays and trays and trays of plants they're starting and I know they don't have room for them all in their garden so how do we get something organized like that down this neck of the woods wonderful I'm so excited and by this when you say this neck of the woods um how how wide do you want to go how the Carolinian zone as a whole <laughs> sure why not I mean yeah I consider my territory here London to Windsor to Sarnia because I'm in the center of that triangle so yeah well I guess you know it could be uh, I, I would love to talk more about this and definitely I think there's a I think that's a fabulous idea to do something um, along these lines where you're at uh, and it could be very organized. It could be kind of, yeah, very organized, or it could be a lot looser. Like the people you know who are growing a lot of, um, who are starting a lot of seeds and will have a lot of plants, even like ask at the farmer's market, could you set up a table one day for free just to give those plants away? Like how, that would be a very kind of simple and and maybe not highly organized way to do it do you think that's a pot, the sort of thing that could could fly um is that of interest that, or yeah. I mean at, at this point uh you know it's something that we don't have down here we don't have the uh swallowtail either right. you know so uh, okay that's okay we're, we're gonna uh Rick will you be a uh a, in your zone and block ambassador for a very big block. And we'll talk more about how, how to really organize something around seed sitting there. I, I'd love that. I, I think that's a great idea. And I just, I wanna say, I don't know if everyone here knows Rick, but Rick has um, also written a book um, about gardening with native plants. And so if any of you have publishing tips for Rick or connections, I mean, right? Rick, I really, I, you know, I hope you don't mind that I'm, um, yeah. I don't know. We're getting closer, but we're not there yet. Okay, good. Yeah, because Rick has a book that needs to get published as well. And so um, it's going to be an amazing resource. Yeah. Anyway, and, and Rick also gives talks about gardening with native plants. Uh, Rick's garden in, um, is it Ridgetown? Yep. Yeah, is spectacular. I don't know how many hundreds of native plants, different species of native plants you've got growing there, but it's incredibly inspirational. 320 in the spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah. And you go by the nativeplantgardener.ca, is that yep. right? Your website? Yeah, I encourage everybody to check out Rick's website, nativeplantgardener.ca. Thank you. Okay, I'm just nativeplantgardener.ca. Okay, I've just put that into everybody and I've put my own email address in there too because I'm going to make a, a little announcement and very soon we're going to have an opportunity for you to make announcements about programs that you're doing, upcoming events 
in your area. You'll have 30 to 60 seconds to talk about this fabulous work that you're doing and invite us all to attend uh, your next event. But I put my email address in there because Audrey and I are going to uh, Mexico to see the butterflies on February 25th. And we have one spot left. So if you want to go for a week to see the butterflies, just email me and I'll tell you about it. Uh, that's February 25th. If you would like to go earlier, I know of other trips that have some last minute spots uh, available. And if you want to see the monarchs and it's spectacular, there can be 10 thousand monarchs on a single tree. I'm going to share my screen again. And we are going to look at something else. What are we going to look at? Um, Well, that's not going to happen exactly right now. So I'm going to read what I was going to say. And, but I have to share something or I can't get back. So we will share my whiteboard and then stop sharing it. Okay, so uh, Lorraine is, her book is coming out uh, and it has a different name. And it's called the Northern Guard, Gardener's Guide. Carol, do you want me to, Carol, would you like me to share my screen? Because I've got it, a slide of it. Well, that would be fantastic. And, and Lorraine's going to give us a discount code, <laughs> uh, which is uppercase Northern to save 20% off this book. Good job, Lorraine. Did that work? Yes, I'm looking at a Northern Gardener's Guide to Native Plants and Pollinators. Use discount code NORTHERN to save 20%. And where you're going to get this book for our American friends is islandpress.org slash books. And once you get there, you're going to type in the name Northern Gardener's Guide to Native Plants and take a screenshot of this really quickly. Mm -hmm. Yes, screenshot. You know how to do that. And then you'll be able to get a 20% discount off of Lorraine's book, which will apply more to the Northern states. Yeah, for this one, for the US edition, we actually, um, we, we, we basically just added a whole bunch of plants. Um, it's, so it's, it's very similar to the Ontario edition with about, I would say, I don't know, 25, at least 25 more plants profiled in the book and probably 50 or 100 or more mentioned for those for the um, US regions covered the Northeast, the upper Midwest and the Great Lakes. Okay, thank you. And now um, I, I want to mention that we in Ontario, we have a lot of rules about what we can and can't grow in our front yards. And we know that in the States, we have condominiums, in the States there's these HOAs, Homeowners Association, and they tell you you can only have your plants up to, you know, four inches, and so you got to have a grass and all of this stuff. So naturally, this does not help with our, uh, 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 our native plants. And Lorraine has gotten involved in a case that's going to change our laws to make more sense. And it happened in Smith's Falls. Lorraine, go ahead, tell us about that. Yeah, well, um, so these uh, native plant gardeners, habitat gardeners um, in Smith's Falls, they were cited, they were told they had to remove their garden, they were told they had to remove their habitat logs, all the good things that they were doing, and they fought back. And it took great effort, but um, including an appeals uh, committee meeting and they, um, they launched a lawsuit, but it was settled out of court. This, the town of Smith Falls had to pay for the Sinclair's legal costs. And the what has happened is the town um, uh, is changing its bylaw, changing its grass and weeds bylaw so that it supports efforts like this to plant native plants, to create habitat. 
And I listened to uh, a town council meeting just the other night where they presented their new bylaw and they have um, gone to great lengths to support pollinators with the, with the new bylaw. So these changes are happening in municipalities all over the place, but it's in response to people who are um, concerned about pollinators, want to support pollinators, want to support um, insects and biodiversity. It depends on all of us actually letting our elected representatives know that these things matter, that they're important to us, that we want policies. Because a lot of towns or municipalities have supportive like general pollinator strategies or biodiversity strategies or, or their bee cities or all of these things. And yet these grass and weeds bylaws are often so vaguely written and arbitrarily enforced that people who are creating habitat are ordered to remove that habitat. And it takes so much effort to fight back that a lot of people just say, okay, you know what? you know, oh my goodness, my neighbors have complained. They don't like it. Okay, and now the city's giving me a hard time. I'm just gonna get rid of it. It's easier. Well, we, um, what, we, what we need to do is we need to show, demonstrate with our gardens that these, like the more of these habitat gardens that exist, the harder it will be for municipalities and cities to, to keep up with, um, you know, uh, enforcing these vague and arbitrary bylaws that that actually harm biodiversity. So take a look. I mean, it's it's shocking if you actually look at your your city municipalities, whatever. If you look at your grass and weeds bylaw, chances are you will be shocked. Burlington has a grass and weeds bylaw that says you cannot have nesting bees. I'm serious. It says that. Um, so, I mean, is it enforced? Uh, I've never heard of anyone being <laughs> told to get to, you know, that if they have uh, bumblebees nesting or, you know, cavity nesting bees in the plant stalks that they've so helpfully left over the, you know, left standing to support those cavity, those bees that nest in plant stalks. I've never heard of someone in Burlington being told they have to get rid of their nesting bees, but it's on the books and the message that it sends. You know, we've, we've got a lot of insectophobia, I would say, that's <laughs> supported by bad bylaws. So anyway, it, it's a kind of, pet it's a it's a thing of mine because I think it actually delegitimizes these bylaws can create real problems for people who want to do good things so I you know we got to change those bad bylaws and if we just think about things like when you know think about think back well it was only on what when did the um Ontario noxious weed list remove milkweed it was 2014 or 2015 you think about that, um, you know, are these attitudes we have to like official attitudes, I mean, to quote unquote weeds, um, they're pernicious and they have huge impact. And as you know, you know, as you all, all you monarch protectors and um, uh, know very well, we need to rethink a lot of things and, and we need to reform these bad bylaws, bylaws. Yeah, someone just put in the chat that Brantford is also, I saw the new, the direction that Brantford is going in with new bylaws, amazing. We just need to encourage our, we just like to, we just need to let our elected local representatives know that biodiversity is important to us. Like it's as simple as that, I think. Yeah, and it's really important to be proactive, to speak yeah. to your counselor, to speak to your mayor, to speak to everybody, because the people who are fighting these laws, because somebody comes around and says, we're, we're, we're cutting down everything, and they actually do, that you've been building for 30 years, uh, they have to spend a fortune of their own money fighting this in court. And it, it, it's, it's so unfair. So if we could do our part and, and get our local 
councilors to change these laws so that we can grow what the land intends to produce, it would save everybody a lot of trouble. There's a, there's a very well-known case in the States right now too, that um, ha has just gone through where somebody fought and fought and fought and, and, and won. But it, that's a really hard way to, is to spend 50 or $100,000 or, or, or try to raise some money for legal costs when we could be doing it one by one by one by one by one. So I'm going to hold the questions right now. And I hope that Lorraine, after I close the meeting, you'll stay for a minute or two and see if there are any other questions. I'm going to go to other announcements and I'm going to make the first one. And if you have an announcement, put your hand up. And we will try to get to that. Okay, I've stopped my video. What I really meant was to get rid of my background. Okay, I'm going to get rid of my background. And I'm going to shamelessly talk about my new book, which is called Five Butterflies. And it talks about five butterflies, but it's really a backdoor way of getting young people to explore the world that's outside their door it's um, nonfiction, but it has all kinds of things you won't find in any other book, like the history of the monarch uh, biosphere being created, the story and the history of butterfly farming. And um, it's got all kinds of very nice pictures on it. And it will get young people off the computer and outside. And thank you, Heidi. I didn't pay Heidi to talk about raising monarch butterflies. But personally, I think that the raising of any kind of caterpillar is the ideal gateway into all of nature. You plant a milkweed, you raise a caterpillar, you've got a butterfly in your hand, you tag it, and it goes to Mexico like Don Davis's did. And all of a sudden, you are hooked and you want to plant everything. Those um, That book that I just showed you, How to Raise Monarch Butterflies, has sold 50,000 copies. So you know that it's a, it's a good choice. It's 10 bucks. So you can't go wrong with it. And I'm now going to look for hands up with announcements. There are no hands up that I can see with announcements. So Gwen, you could ask your question and then we'll um, we'll get some parting words from Lorraine. So Gwen, are you still there? And yep. do you still have your question? Yep. Um, I actually have more of a statement or, or a comment than a question. Um, I am the person from Brantford that posted that Brantford's doing this native planting thing. Um, I am one of the four butterfly ray rangers in Brantford currently um, that have made this huge mark on Brantford. And um, we we were very, very, very fortunate to have a butterfly way ranger on our council. And she did some amazing things um, be, at, before she left. And now she's in Nova Scotia. So you people in Nova Scotia have just gained an awesome resource um, and, and our loss, your gain. So um, they, they started, they did an amendment to, for the bylaws and then everything kind of went yep we're going to do that we're going to do that and then we had an election and some of the people that supported us aren't there anymore and i don't i don't know right now where it's gone but we certainly uh the butterfly way rangers are certainly pushing to um amend our bylaws about the noxious we are the weeds in the garden and one of the things that we really have to teach people is the difference between native plants and non-native plants. Because, you know, you see somebody's garden and they haven't done anything with it and it's full of dog strangling vine and I don't know, thistles and things that- Garlic, don't belong mustard. Here. Right, and, and that's where we get the bad rap. So, I have a house down the street that does exactly that. And it looks terrible. Then you come down the street to my yard where I've put on all this, all this work. I've gotten rid of all the lawn and I, I still have what people call weeds. Fortunately, my neighbors haven't complained yet, um, but I asked permission. 
to do it before I, I went. I went to bylaw. I said, can I do this? They said, yes, you can do this. And so um, education is a huge key in um, when you want the city to change the bylaws. You have to you have to explain the difference between native and non-native and what it means for them, which plants should be here and which plants shouldn't be here. So um, we have asked Brantford to only plant native trees. They have said they will only plant native trees from now on, which is a huge step. That's it's a huge, huge. step. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Gwen, have you got um, your butterfly ranger signage in your front yard? I do. I do. Um, I have two signs in my front yard. I have the original David Suzuki sign and the, the one for our Butterfly Way program in Brantford. Um, but we also have a map um, of about 200 gardens that, that we got started. The, like we have a thousand people in our Facebook group. That's fantastic. Uh, it, it's Brantford, Brantford Butterfly Way and surrounding area on Facebook. And if you want to join, you can join. Um, even if you're not in Brantford, but you please just ask, answer the questions or we won't let you in. Um, and we are more than help, happy to help anybody. Um, I have no problem helping anybody with this. I've been in the garden club and schools and all kinds of stuff um, to promote this. So um, yeah, so we have a map. I think it's in our group uh, and it's huge. It's, it's all over the place, there's, you know, we did a plant giveaway at the beginning when we started and um, we, got, we got a grant. We picked 50 people, we gave away plants. People kept want, coming back, coming back, coming back. We order plants for them, they keep coming back. So it is spreading, but you, you have to educate people. You have to educate people. Good, well, you are sure doing a fantastic job and so many people in this group are. And now I'm going to hand it over to Lorraine to have the last word, hey, second, just, last, second last word. <laughs> okay, well, I just wanna say thank you to everyone. And I did see that there was one question very early on in the chat, and I think it's a good way to end as well. And the question had to do with, you know, if you want to support um, native bees with native plants in your yard, what are what are quote unquote the best ones to plant? And I always have trouble with the the best ones kind of list. But what I will say is, and we didn't even really talk about this tonight, the whole issue of pollen specialist bees, which we didn't get into. But I know that you know, as butterfly folks and you totally appreciate the, the specificity of the host plants for butterflies, well, there's something kind of similar with bees in that there are pollen, about a quarter of the bees in, northeastern, in the Northeast, so including Ontario, are pollen specialists. So they need the pollen from specific plants to raise their young, okay? So, and this is, based on work by um, uh, Jared Fowler and Sam Drogi. And they, their research has shown that the four top genera of native plants to support these pollen specialist bees. And if you support the specialists, you'll be supporting the, the other you know, three quarters who are generalists. But if you only support the generalists, you won't be supporting the specialists, right? So the top genera, of native plants for the pollen specialist bees. So the ones I'd highly recommend, and within these genera, there is a lot of diversity in terms of species. The goldenrods, the native goldenrods, and there's you know more than a dozen different native goldenrods here in Ontario to choose from. And not all of them are kind of rapidly spreading. So goldenrods, asters, and there are dozens of asters to choose from for every condition you might have. Rudbeckias, so like the black-eyed Susans or the green-headed coneflower. And um, the native sunflowers, the um, helianthus. And again, there's such diversity within those. So if you're looking for a place to start and you, native plants to start with, or if you want to add some native plants to your garden and you're wondering which ones, 
you can't go wrong if you choose from either the goldenrods, asters, rudbeckias, or native sunflowers, the helianthus. So I, I just, and you'll be supporting the pollen specialist bees and you'll be supporting the generalists as well. And as you know, the, um, the number of uh, moths um, for which the um, goldenrods and the asters uh, and the rudbeckias and the sunflowers are host plants, larval host plants. The list is huge for them too. So that's what I'd suggest. And I, it's just my, my final tip. Well, Lorraine, thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing all this. You know, I've known Lorraine for, for 10 years, but only superficially. So I was very excited to learn more through my research for this interview and uh, by hearing you. And you're kind enough to cover some of my presentations for me. And it, 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 it's, it's a really good community when you get into native plants and you wake up in the morning and you think of flowers and plants and insects and butterflies and and uh, it, it's a good cause to to get yourself involved in and uh, this is part of our beat the winter blues program so thank you for uh, cheering everybody up and leaving everybody on a positive note like that and with that i will close the meeting um which means you can leave but you don't have to leave. Um, uh, Lorraine, you can leave. Your questions have all been answered or you can stay for a few minutes, but the meeting is going to be officially over. I'm going to turn off the recording and those who want to stay and just have a live chat, we turn it into a free for all where anybody can unmute at any time and uh, talk to anyone. So I'm going to turn off the recording now. I'm, I'm going to try to. I'm going to hit that. Recording. We're going to turn off Facebook Live. Stop live stream. Oh, and stop 